Good evening. Welcome to the April 13th Scarborough Zoning Board of Appeals meeting. And we'll open it off. Read roll call, please. Ms. Shoup? Mr. Blaze? Here. Mr. Hebert? Here. Mr. Richards? Here. Mr. Crockett? Here. Mr. Stark? And Mr. Murren? Here. Okay. Uh, first on the agenda is. Pardon? Oh, yes. Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I. Uh, Before we start, I want to do a couple of things. Number one, I, I want to welcome Mr. Lavoper. I haven't seen him in a long time. Mr. Lavoper, it's so good to see you again. Glad you're here. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Mr. Lavoper has been a strong sport and uh, a very, very well known and respected man. Right back there, if you can get him on the camera. And he used to come to all the council meetings and was always supportive of whatever we did. So it's a pleasure to see you. And the second piece of the agenda is uh, number 2571 is going to be postponed until the beginning. It will be the first item on next month's agenda. If it goes beyond that, then we'll deal with taking it off per the new regulate procedures. So that leaves us with appeal number 2569, which is a miscellaneous appeal. You're catching me today. I'm trying to get, trying to get you out early. Um, let's come back to approval a minute. So I have a motion on the minutes. Motion to approve as presented. Second. Stain. All in favor? That's your name. Stain. Stain. Uh, the uh, miscellaneous appeal request from uh, Christopher Klings. Did I pronounce that name properly? Klings. Thank you, sir. Uh, 411 Payne Road, assessor's map R38, parcel 23. And I see we have the head of SEDCO here uh, with them. That's impressive that you're there. If you'd like to take the microphone, explain what you'd like to do, and we'll go from there. <coughs> First, state your names and address, please. Christopher Klingis, 18 Cloverleaf Lane, Scarborough. And I'm his wife, Teresa Klingis, 18 Cloverleaf Lane, Scarborough. Thank you. And what are you trying to accomplish? Uh, we are um, currently uh, running a dog daycare boarding and training facility in South Portland. Um, and we are looking to move that business from South Portland to Scarborough. Um, we've been looking for quite some time to try to find a new place for our business. Um, this building has a really great um, layout for what we're trying to do with minimal impact to the building um, in the surrounding areas. And we're just hoping to provide a really great service uh, to the community. Okay. And uh, said Coke had to jump in at this point, or? Okay. For those of you who don't know, Sedco is Scarborough Economic Development Corp. And what they do is help businesses in Scarborough uh, walk through the process, the maze of becoming uh, successful. And it's a great program. It's been around for at least 20 years, 30 years. Uh, I've been on the board. It's a great organization. And th that's the difference between Scarborough and a lot of towns. And I think that's important to mention. I think they do a good job. So um, I see you've got the planning board minutes. Has everybody had a chance to read the planning board minutes uh, for the advisory opinion? I just passed. I know that. Is there any questions on the advisory per uh, permission from the planning board? So let's go right into, uh, well, before we do that, let's open public hearing, see if anybody would like to speak with this issue. Do we have any letters on or phone calls? We did not. None. Would anybody like to speak to this issue? Okay, seeing none, I'll close the public hearing part. So your, your goal is to have a, a, is it a dog daycare or grooming or a combination? Combination of that, sir. Okay. Grooming, boarding, daycare, uh, and training. Okay. Do you want to read into the minutes what you've got here? If you'd like to, that might be the easiest way. The justification well, of variance? Yeah, the, the record is the, the tape, so the best thing to do is actually have you read in the justification, and then we'll go through each one of the items. Okay. 
Okay. Mighty Paws is proposing to change the current non-conforming use to a new non-conforming use in the B2 zone at 411 Payne Road in Scarborough. Our proposal is to convert this space into a premium dog daycare, boarding, grooming, and training facility. The proposal calls for considerable change inside the building. It is largely a clear space, but very little to none to the outside. The only visual change to the footprint would be on Mussey Road, garage side, where we propose to add brick-type solid wall to contain the area immediately outside the garages. We intend for that to be the outdoor portion of our indoor-outdoor yards. The outdoor space will likely only comprise 12,000 to 16, sorry, 1,200 to 1,600 square feet. The picture has been provided to show um, the approximate footprint and the look in which is in line with the overall look of the building. That one right there is the footprint that we're talking Could about. Could you put that back that up? Would be which one? Do the first one right here. Um, I'm trying to place. Is it, so the X's, is that what you're talking about? Yes, yeah. yeah, so that space there would be the okay. general size that we're looking for. <coughs> Great, I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Um, responding to appeals from restrictions on non conforming uses. Um, from Section 3, F1. Section A, our assertion is that our operation is much less impactful to the in, uh, environment and the neighborhood. There will be considerably less traffic to the facility and none during non-business hours of 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. We are not making major changes to the building's footprint. We have far fewer employees and intend to beautify the lot with career landscape and an upscale look and feel to the property and building. Okay, let's stop there for a second. So this is a miscellaneous appeal which falls under uh, the section four um, my category here special exceptions correct you have yeah the criteria is the special exception criteria listed under uh, section four i thank you so it's four i and then we also need to look at the definitions and requirements for uh, dog take cares, which I believe is defined. Do you know what that is? The definition of that? There's oh, the definition? Yeah. It's in section six. Yeah. Is it an animal or dog? I think it's pet care. Facility. Pet care? Care facility. So, just for the record, uh, in 2002, uh, 9 4, an establishment that provides fully enclosed facilities for training, kenneling, grooming of pets. So, that's the definition, and that might bring a little bit of an issue regarding the open area. I just want to make everybody aware that that language is in there, and that's that definition. It doesn't mean anything at this point, it's just something I want to bring up for discussion, okay? Um, and there are no uh, there's no requirements or uh, performance performance standards on this. Okay, good. Okay. So what I'll do, if you'd like, is I'm going to read in the the, uh, the question. Okay. And if you can answer it as you've got it written, or if you want to elaborate, feel free. And and talk as loud as you can. You don't have to scream, but uh, and you can pull that microphone up a little bit if you want to. Okay. Thanks. So the, the proposed use will not create unsanitary or unhealthful conditions by reason of sewage and disposal, emissions to the air or water, or other aspects of its design or operation. Currently the space is home to AAA where they run a, um, I have since learned that it's not 24 hours, but 7 a.m. to 11, maybe 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, dispatch center, there's a constant flow of traffic including cars, company, pickups, tow trucks, um, <coughs> further information from the gentleman who ran the operation uh, at the AAA in building um, explained to me I have 35 employees um, with an additional 30 pieces of equipment and three ships. At any time passing by the space, and I should also mention that at this point the, the, the space is vacant, but at the time of this writing AAA was there. Um, Anytime passing by the space, there are a large amount of cars parked randomly about the property, including the non-paved, what used to be grass area. AAA also services and washes their vehicles inside the facility. And as expected, there is oil and engine type fluids that make contact with the ground and drainage. 
Um, our use is much less environmentally impact impactful as we are not constantly generation, um, generating emissions to pollute the air and we don't use harmful chemical, chemicals as we're handling live animals. Our cleaning procedures are such that all waste is removed immediately and the areas are cleaned. Solid waste is bagged and removed by private sanitation companies weekly and liquid waste is washed into a drainage system that leads to a previously installed cistern which filters out contaminants and is pumped on a determined schedule. Okay, great. The next item is how the proposed use will not create unsafe vehicular or pedestrian traffic conditions when added to the existing or foreseeable traffic in its vicinity. Um, our traffic impact would be considerably less than the current occupant, who again has longer business hours. Um, the majority of client drop-offs occur between 6 a.m. and 10 a.m., and the majority of pickups occur between 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. Uh, in 2010, a study for the Gorham Corridor sites, uh, directional peak hour volumes during the p.m. peak hour were calculated, and the results are listed. Southwest on Payne Road, northeast of Bridges Road, 1,239 vehicles per hour. Southwest on Payne Road, northeast of Muffy Road, 1,082 vehicles per hour. And though not included in the study, these numbers should be similar in the AM peak hours, but travel the other direction. Uh, vehicles traveling northeast in the PM and southwest in the AM fall into their normal category of less than 1,000 vehicles per hour. It is likely that these numbers have either remained steady or in increased since the study. Uh, our plan is to provide daycare services beginning at about 60 dogs. Uh, and even if every dog arrived in a single car and we had zero boarders, um, adding 60 uh, cars to that number of cars that traveled past that intersection at peak hours would only be roughly 0.05% increase. Okay. Thank you. We have six to eight employees at a time, and our business has a similar impact as a child's daycare. And I also want to mention we talked about an increase in the traffic, but this was written before we spoke with AAA. And now that we have learned more information about the amount of traffic that was in and out from both their employees and their trucks, we feel that we'll have uh, slightly less than AAA, but certainly not more than they did. Okay, thank you. What I was referring to on the less was the impact to the existing traffic that's already there. Good, okay. And the pros use will not create public safety problems which would be substantially different from those created by existing uses in the neighborhood or require a substantially greater degree of fire, uh, municipal fire or police protection than existing uses in the neighborhood? We will not. Perfect answer. <laughs> some, of them are, some of them kind of trick questions. Uh, the proposed use will not result in sedimentation or erosion or have an adverse effect on the water supplies. The proposed use will not. Would you do me a favor and elaborate on that regarding uh, the dog, uh, dog um, PCs and urine and all sure. that um, Our design, though currently um, not fully developed, but our plan at this point is to do, like I said, the indoor outdoor yards. That's completely covered by an artificial turf or canine grass product um, that is uh, antibacterial in nature. Uh, it has drainage underneath it um, that filters into the cistern, as we discussed. And solid waste is immediately picked up, bagged, garbage brought out to a dumpster which is uh, picked up by a sanitation company, sorry, um, and the uh, liquid waste would be washed into that, uh, cleaned with the product and then washed into the drainage system. Okay. And the drainage system, you mean the general drainage system, the, the, the sanitary districts? The cistern. There's a cistern uh, situation, uh, installed cistern which my understanding of it is that it filters out harmful chemicals, harmful things to the water supply, and then it will keep them and it needs to be pumped out at a, similar to a septic. Is that the, the Vortechnic Vortec system, do you know? Fortunately, the, the, the property owner does not know much <coughs> about the building, and this is the information that we're getting from um, the AAA people. Okay. Hi, Karen Martin with the Scarborough Economic Development Corporation. Um, uh, one of the things that we did talk with, we did talk to the uh, Scarborough Sanitary District, and they were um, 
clear that they, they didn't want the waste going into the regular district and they felt comfortable, and Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe they felt comfortable with the, um, the cistern piece where it does get pumped out, but I'm not sure if it was the Boral Technics uh, model, or, model or not. Okay, but that, is it that kind of philosophy? If you don't know, that's okay. I just I, but this is something that's this is something that's already there at the building now. Yes, and, it, sir. and it met the requirements of an automobile. It's probably on the on uh, on the order of a sand filter that would filter out chemical and petroleum type residues from the vehicle repair. Washing. A wash they bay. Currently wash down into drains. Yeah. So they are, whatever is existing yeah. there has okay. been containing the chemicals and it has been in compliance. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, the see. proposed use will not uh, result in sedimentation or erosion. We've done. Uh, we have proposed use will uh, result in sedimentation or erosion or have an adverse effect on the water that, supply. That was the one you were answered. Thank you. Yeah. Proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to physical size, visual impact, intensity of use, proximity to other structures, and density of development. The professional look that we are aiming for comes coinciding with. Uh, matching the exterior look and feel of the office portion of the building, um, combined with the focus on beautiful landscaping, removal of the junkyard type feel that it has, uh, will be much more in line with the neighboring structures. And the use of the dog as a dog daycare will be a valuable service to the area. Okay. And uh, do people typically come in at like 7 in the morning and pick them up at 5 at night like a daycare, like a regular child daycare, or do they leave them over the weekend? Or? We have about 25% of our occupancy is typically boarding dogs, which does not generate additional traffic. Okay, thank you. Uh, and um, did the planning board specify the 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 uh, features for the, the look, the the plantings, and everything? No, sir. That's uh, uh, our our design. Okay. Um, let's see, I'm sorry, Jim. And uh, you have the. Uh, uh, located, you're not in the shoreland zone, and you have a sufficient right interest to title. Have you got a uh, contract or been working with? You should have a copy of our signed letter of uh, intent, and we are this close to our lease signing. Kind of tonight is a big part of it. Okay. The applicant, you have the technical and financial ability to meet the standards of section of this section. And if we come up with any other things that we might need to add, okay with that? I don't really know what that means. We just always say it. So okay. <laughs> um, I never used to mean that uh, <laughs> that I know what I'm doing and building this business. Um, I, I started from the ground up in South Portland. I feel like I have the technical ability uh, in building uh, my current business from the ground up. The general contact for contactor for our initial build out, and have been maintaining the building ever since. And financially, uh, even though there's a commercial pre-approval, but we we have pretty solid financing for this that's project. I guess that's as good as we can get with any of that answer. Uh, the uh, proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to generation of noise and hours of operation. Our use will co be compatible with the existing uses in the neighborhood. There is no doubt that dogs at play will bark, but we, what we do not permit is incessant barking. Our outdoor play space is such a small percentage of our overall yard space, most sound will be captured indoors. Furthermore, we plan to m mitigate sound. The outdoor play space will have higher walls to capture the sound, and we're working with a company called AcoustaBlock to incorporate their AcoustaFence product into our facility. This product boasts an 85% reduction in sound abatement to the human ear. Our hours of operation are 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Friday, and uh, eight to five Saturdays and Sunday, far fewer than the larger portion, seven to 11 or one or two o'clock in the morning that was <coughs> previously there. And I'm, I'm familiar with Acoustic Block, and it, I, because that's in here, are you planning on using that or are you just looking at it? We were planning to do as much sound abatement as possible. With that product or similar with product? With that product or similar, there's several, everything is up in the air right now. Not up in the air, but everything is we're planning, so we've got a lot of flexibility. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right. It's definitely in the plan. So let me open up to the, uh, the board for questions and uh, comments. I have a question. Um, so in the existing facility in South Portland right now, do you do overnight boarding? Yes, sir. 
And do you have plans to do that here as well? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, then uh, I guess the only comment that I have is in Section I, as you say, you're, you're planning to have the, um, I guess the acoustical mitigation just to sort of make sure that everything kind of remains quiet, even though that is mostly an industrial area. So that's, uh, I guess, it's good to hear. Mr. Blaze? Uh, <clears throat> is all traffic going to be coming in from uh, Payne Road? Or will traffic be coming in from Muzzy Road also? Again, um, we are kind of open on that topic. If there's something that uh, the board would recommend, we're happy to look at it. Uh, currently, the plan would be to access the building from the front on Payne Road um, because of the, the look and feel of it. Uh, we would plan to have employee parking on the Muzzy Road side. And there is no, currently, there is no um, pass through of the parking areas from the back of the building, from Muzzy Road side to the main road side. I think that's by design so that people don't cut through. Um, but at this point, we are planning on using Payne Road as the primary entrance. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> one other question. You said you were going to be doing training. What training classes or are you going to be training dogs yourself? Well, we training. would likely be doing both training classes and um, daycare training, which is something we do typically every day. We reinforce positive behaviors, discourage negative ones uh, in the daycare setting. Uh, if you have classes, they have to be during the day then? Uh, from a operational standpoint or? We've hosted classes in the past and it's been a very small part of our business. Um, I think maybe twice a year we've hosted an eight-week class where once a week at 7 p.m. we have about um, five to ten dogs come for a class for an hour and then they leave. So it has not been a large portion of our business from a financial or from an uh, operational standpoint whatsoever. Now, I'm not sure we're going to continue that immediately when we open in Scarborough because it's not our core business, but that's why it's in here because we may have occasional training classes. Okay, so your hours of operation are not really 6 in the morning till 7 at night. They could be for more. Maybe 8 to 16 days per year. They may be an extra hour, yeah. Okay, thank you. I, I would mention, sir, that one of the issues that we had with our training program is due to our current facility, it was not possible for us to begin a training session until after we were closed for daycare business. If we were to do a training space in here, those classes could be during business hours. You can't do it in here. This <laughs> <laughs> is a really great space, though. So it could be great. I know the record is with the tape, but no. Tied yeah. um, to that, uh, Mr. Blaze's comment, to me it seems like you're open 24 hours a day, not that I have a problem with that, but if you have dogs in there. Customer act. Access, I guess, is what I'm referring to. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that because you do have, I'm assuming you have somebody there at night. Um, currently, we don't. Um, it's surprising um, from when I first started investigating this business. Uh, primarily, not a lot of people have people overnight. Uh, in investigating, learning more about it, there's a very good reason why you don't. Um, dogs that play for 12 to 13 hours, even with significant break times during the day, uh, are very tired at night. Um, you put them into bed, 7 o'clock at night. If you were to be there and go in and check up on them, you're going to wake them all up. You're going to have soilage. You're going to have dogs that have accidents in their suites. Um, and we're not going to staff to take everybody out to go to the bathroom at that point. It is something we can we are, we are going to consider in the, in the future, um, but a lot depends on what the zoning um, board has or their, what the town has to say about how we do the operation there. We certainly don't want to have dogs outside at 2 o'clock in the morning when anybody could hear them, that kind of thing. Um, but so far, in the four and a half years that we've been in operation, we've had no issues with that. Dogs are typically asleep when we get there in the morning and we have to wake them up to go outside. Thank you. And as far as I know, there's no residential business anywhere near there, is there? I don't think there's anything even close to it. The closest is down by St. Joe's, down by the coffee shop. But yeah. that's quite a ways that's from quite, Yeah, I, I don't think there's any. The only thing that I'm interested in is do have the school right there. Uh, yeah, but, yeah. Elementary school. Huh? 
the elementary school. Yeah, there's an elementary school right there. Which it's is great because people could just drop off their dog and then their kids. It's well, I'm just wondering fun. when, my question to that is, is when you folks are thinking, I'm trying to envision, you're saying taking the dogs out, are you taking them out or are you, or are you just bringing them in the building to an area that is turf? It would be indoor and outside, sir, depending on weather. Um, we we're, we're main, so there's a good portion of the time of the year where we can't be outside. So we would close the door, keep everybody inside in those inclement weather days. Other days we'd have it inside and outside so the dogs could flow back and forth. So, so the, the location of the outdoor section of the fencing off is relative to this is... Must be roadside, sir. Where's your pen? Where's your little highlight? It's going to be in, in this that area. area. This is it's opposite side of the school. Just pay attention to the slides. <laughs> Stop <laughs> criticizing. <laughs> so it's um, it's the opposite side of the school then. This this shows this is the monkey road side. I'll use the pen to make you have <laughs> That's the area I believe uh, that the Klinguses are, are talking about fencing in. Correct. And um, the school is off to the back side down the there. The school right? would be in this right. Right. section there. Okay. The only question I have with that is, I, I know a business owner that we go and have meetings at occasionally in his property in Portland, and he has a doggy daycare right next door, and it's very loud when the dogs are out and they're going and running and doing their thing. I'm just wondering how that noise level, or if there's any buffering that could carry over to the school says so teachers are trying to teach and you got the dogs out at 10 o'clock in the morning and they're just getting in the class and getting the kids going or if kids are out at recess I'm sure the dogs are probably going to hear the kids yelling and screaming and everything so. understood sir um, can I assume that you're talking about um, okay uh, <laughs> sorry um, don't worry about the, re the relax <laughs> on this. We're, we're, we're pretty easy going to relax and then you can just... I, I understand the concern there and I've been in the space where you know, I know what you're talking about. Um, there's a big difference between a fully outside yard where hundreds of dogs are out together versus indoor-outdoor spaces where there's lots of choices. The other thing that you need to keep in mind is our philosophy is about small group sizes. Our dogs are all grouped into no larger than 12 dogs per staff member, and so no larger than 12 dogs per space. So at any one time, you're not going to have that many dogs outside. Combine that with our plan to have as high walls as Scarborough will allow us to have to block the, the sound, in addition to the AcoustaBlock product or other sound baffling things, we think that we're not going to be able to hear us at the school. And it I'm is, if you travel the property, it is a bit away. It seems kind of right next to Yeah, it is a bit away. Yeah, there's um, two large office buildings with property around them before you get to the school on Muzzy between our play yards and the school. It does have kind of an echoing effect over in some of those areas, though. So I'm familiar, I, I believe I'm familiar with where you're referring to, and I've, I've, I've felt that before. Yeah. And that we don't, we are actually, there's a res, there are two residents down the street from my current facility. We are outside, the full outside yards there as well, and haven't had any complaints from noise. Other questions from the board? Um, just a couple of other things that they sent down to us from the zoning board, I guess. Planning board. The review of the landscaping. They wanted to have us do it. Sure, I'll tell you, why don't we go through, uh, this was my next okay. plan anyway, so if you'd like to do this, we'll just, just go line by line through what the planning board had for discussions. I only had a couple that I actually lined off here. So. Uh, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'd like to put in to record what the planning board uh, advisory opinion had, and I'd like to address each one of those as to whether or not we concur or feel that that's not necessary. We cannot go against the planning board's position unless we find the right cause, but we can abbreviate what uh, yes has a wide range of options. So if we decide that we want to do any other changes, this doesn't bind us to changes. The challenge would be if they said, yeah, we look good. this looks good, uh, we need to have a legitimate reason per code to not allow it. Okay. So just so you understand the flexibilities we, we do have, which are quite a bit. So it says, uh, Mr. Mr. Chase informed the board that the applicant is before the board for an advisory opinion. Um, Mr. Saunders asked, I'm just skipping as we go through here. 
about what the location appealed to the applicants. Um, Karen Martin representing SEDCO, about the location for the high visibility. Uh, you explained that they create more home-like environment and not feel so individual. Uh, they'll be adding some landscaping to uh, upgrade the site. I think we need to discuss that. Just I'm going to set that off to the side. Um, uh, Ms. Sons asked uh, what their plan was for waste management. I think that question has been answered. Does everybody feel comfortable with the yes. waste management discussion on this? Well, the only thing I had is just like it's saying that it's going to be disposed of in a dumpster so that's when emptied weekly. I mean, what type of dumpster is it going in? It probably has air fresh, so you're not just tossing it all in there, right? Uh, we have currently we have a dumpster. I don't know of many other different types of dumpsters, but if there are others that we could investigate, I'm all for it. It's not Can you bag it. Currently, bag it anyway. currently you're what you're doing is not permitting an owner the way you're disposing of no, it. No, sir. We we bag the we have trash cans that waste goes in the trash cans. The trash cans get bagged and then rebagged and then put into the dumpster. Um, it's Weekly is where we are right now. Depending on the amount of dogs that we have, we will happily increase that pickup. Obviously, it's not something we want to smell either. Okay. So, everybody, you comfortable with that? Just as I want to go through, as we can eliminate what we can. So, we're okay with that. Um, Ms. Iglis asked if there would be a whole, if we would be using, you'd be using the whole site, and you said that you might entertain at some point to sublet to a dog trainer. I've also heard you may train yourself. Um, um, that that option is no longer on the table. We're going to um, uh, occupy the entire facility. Okay. I, I would suggest that you don't put that restriction on yourself. Okay. Uh, it, it just you need know, to come back. <laughs> it's not fun one time. So I wouldn't. So there's no okay. reason to unless the board here it's feels like it should be. Possible in the future. Okay. Um, Mr. Mason asked uh, the entrance for Muzzy Road would be the, would be used. The question uh, exclaimed that uh, we'd be using the employee entrance. Uh, Mr. Mazur asked if there were any residential homes nearby that might be affected by the dogs barking, and we've discussed that. Everybody fine with the noise and the, just so you know that technology that they're talking about <laughs> is absolutely amazing. <coughs> um, it's new. It's a relatively new product. Um, I actually use it in my boat. Um, I have a boat and um, I have two jet engines in it, and they're pretty loud. And what they drove me nuts. So what I did is I use this material. It's literally no thicker than that, and it goes on there. It literally absorbs sound like you wouldn't believe. It's an amazing product, uh, and it does work. It's usually used in if uh, it's usually used in the musician mu musical industry uh, as as a drummer here. I'm a drum guitarist now. Um, so it's, it's typically you'll find it in uh, audio studios uh, as opposed to the, the old uh, egg crate kind of material. It's, all, it's very thin and it's usually got silver linear on it. I don't know if this one does or not. but There are several different products the company offers. Uh, and it's very expensive. And it's very pricey. We're aware. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> we just kind of jumped over the review of landscaping. I, I said to set that on the table. We'll, we'll bring that back. Okay. That's a good reason. Thank you. But uh, uh, let's see. So we're okay with the, the noise. Is that correct? And, and that they're using the appropriate materials. And uh, okay. Ms. Twitt asked a uh, proposed play would trigger a uh, site plan amendment to the question. Mr. Chase st stated that it was not significant level of change, so it would not. Mr. Wood questioned if the traffic analysis was done and it was it staff's opinion and it would have no, uh, no more or less impact. To the question, Mr. Chase stated that the staff was unclear on the traffic patterns and intensity and that the applicant should provide more information to the ZBA. Um, Mr. Chase stated that one of the, re the, one of the review criteria the applicant must answer for the ZBA its proposed use will not create unsafe vehicular or pedestrian traffic conditions when added to existing foreseeable traffic in the vicinity. So um, when you went to the planning board, did you discuss the uh, 2010 numbers? No, sir, that was, not a bit, that was not part of our initial justification. So that was addition. So that was additional. And you said that about 25% of the dogs are overnight yes, and sir. about 75% are. And, uh, 
people bring them in? Is it typically work hours they come in? At? So we, um, I did a short study um, from April, uh, February 1st through April 8th um, and took an by hour check in and check out. Um, and the highest um, period of time, the most busy time for drop offs is between 8 a.m. and 9 a.m. We average about 13 to 15 dogs during that hour. Uh, and uh, check out 5 to 6 p.m., we're averaging close to 20 dogs on a check out basis at that time. Um, and, and, and is it the same volume of dog? This location, I'm assuming, is going to have more dogs in it. Is that it's, true? It's a, at, at, at this point, it's a similar. Similar the And we're going to allow for growth in the future. Okay. Uh, that's a legitimate question from uh, I think it was Mr. Uh, Mr. Wood that asked that. Mr. Wood, uh, does the we'll be coming to those discussions further, but let's set that off to the side also, and we'll discuss that a little bit more. Mr. Bacon also added uh, uh, that the chance for, for the change of use, commercial use, could trigger the pain road impact fees. The ZBA finds the traffic is increased. Mr. Bacon stated that that should be examined by the ZBA. Let's set that off to the side and we'll come back to it. Mr. Wood also asked the applicant uh, what is proposed for signage. It's a question. Uh, the, uh, I want to make sure I get this right. Clingus? Clingus. Clingus, sorry. Responded there. Uh, is an existing sign structure they could utilize, but they're open to suggestions. Mr. Wood stated that this is a uh, good opportunity to improve the signage at that location. We currently have new sign standards, and uh, if the board is comfortable with that, I'd suggest that that just be worked through with, with ZBA, with the uh, code enforcement officer meeting the standard requirements. Does, does the existing sign uh, follow the current standards? My understanding is no. I, I don't know that. I haven't examined that. We would be very interested in keeping the existing structure. The sign itself? Yeah. Okay. So I, I guess the question then comes, is it part of the uh, current sign standards? I don't know that answer. It's a great question. And whether or not we want to... The, the planning board mentioned it. Well, one member of the planning board mentioned it. And we can discuss that. So again, let's set that off to the side. Uh, and get it when it comes through the right items that we're going through. But I think it's important to discuss. Um, Mr. Fellows asked uh, that the peak hours of business are. Those answers have been uh, answered. Anybody have any concerns with the hours? No, the only the only thing with the hours that seems to coincide with, which will probably raise the traffic a little bit, is it also coincides with hours kids are probably going to be dropped off at school. A lot of parents are dropping their kids off at school now and picking them up. So those hours are pretty close to the 3 p.m. the 3 p.m. hour and the 6 a.m. hour. I don't know what time schools drop off now. I don't know what time school starts. So, so may I address that point? Sure, feel free. Um, there's quite a disparity in uh, you know, what I said. The time frame from 6 a.m. till 10 10 a.m. That's you know 50 some odd dogs that are coming in. Um, so your peak is that 15 or so in the morning and the afternoon is a little higher, but that's much later. It's after work time. It's not a 3 o'clock time. Typically now between 3 and 4 p.m., uh, we have about 5.3 pickups. Yeah, because right around 3 p.m. down there, that road, all of Muzzy Road is pretty much all cars. Yes. Yep, just parked off to the side <laughs> and yeah. buses trying to get out. So right. It was That's another reason why we thought it would be great to use Payne Road as a, as a main entrance. Or if you can even suggest maybe, <laughs> you may not be able to just suggest you might want to come and pick up your dog at 4 or something like that. Again, everything is open, so yeah. we're planning at this point to have actual shutdown hours where we're only providing tours and interviewing new dogs at the, uh, between those drop-off and pick-up hours. And I don't have a big issue with pushing that back further to stay away from the school pickup times. Yeah, because that's, that's a nightmare on both lanes. Yep. On Muzzy. Karen, do you do any of the studies regarding the traffic area, the traffic impacts there? We haven't done any of the any uh, studies. At this point, the new information, though, that's coming your way is the um, amount of employees that the previous tenant had. And correct me if I'm wrong, Chris. I'm going to see if I can um, articulate this. So there's somewhere around 35 em 
35 employees for the previous tenant coming in and out, plus the traffic of the um, motor vehicle fleet coming in and out. Um, so what the um, new facility will have with the, the daycare is about six to seven employees, is that correct? And those employees are coming in really um, much earlier than the peak hour, so they're coming in between 5.30 and 6. So those employees won't be there. So it seems to me just sort of a simple math, if you've got 35 employees coming in from the previous uh, business and you've got maybe at the most, um, I'm sorry, how many dogs at, at any one point in the, yes, well, 60 to 70 dogs total, but within the peak hour, I don't think you're going to have 30, out, 30 dogs coming in. So I'm just doing a rough count. It's not an analysis. I think it's a perfect analysis, actually. You know. I think that meets my definition because you're not going to have as many cars as the 35 employees coming in at the same time or leaving at the same time. Right. I, I, that makes me feel comfortable. Again, I don't it's know not how the board feels about it. But by the same token, I've been down there numerous times. I've never seen all of them coming and going at the same time, you know. I, I honestly very don't underutilized from what I've seen. There's always cars there, but I haven't really seen them all right. coming out at the same time or anything. Okay. Um, Just one further um, comment on that. We also have mostly car traffic versus the large trucks that were coming in and out of there, so we feel that that's a little bit less impactful as well uh, in addition to the quantities. Okay. So let's now go back. We've got some side items that we're going to deal with. Uh, let's go back to the standards and discuss each standard and apply those standards and pull the planning department's comments in with it. And by the way, uh, if you could thank the planning board, I think that's the best job they've ever done on it. Usually it's just cursory. And they went pretty thorough through this, which is good and bad. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it makes it, it helps because obviously they've, they've looked at a lot of the same information and they did come back favorably. Um, they don't indicate how, whether they voted or not. Did they vote, or was it just a kind of a? Yes, they did vote. Was it unanimous? Yeah. yeah. I believe so. Okay. We had a really great feeling coming out of that meeting. Actually. Now remember that just because they voted unanimous, if it doesn't meet our regulations, it's a different conversation. Okay. Just to clarify that, but we'll talk about that too. All right, the proposed use will not create unsanitary or unhealthful conditions by reason of sewage disposal, emissions to the air or water, or other aspects of its design or operation. What I would like to do is start with Mr. Blaze, if you're okay with that, Mr. Blaze, just with your experience, uh, start at your end, uh, state your positions on that and why. We'll put that as part of the record and tie it with the findings of fact and the conclusions of law. What is this now? What I'd like to do is each individual item, if yeah. you're comfortable with it, just with your experience being on the board and the council. If we could start with you and come down this way, what we'll do is go through uh, each item on this agenda and everybody will speak to it. We'll use that as findings of fact and then finalize with the um, conclusions of law. So the uh, question is, the proposed use will not create unsanitary or unhelpful conditions by reason of sewage disposal, emissions to the air or water or other aspects of its design or operation. How do you feel about those items? I agree. You agree? Yeah. Okay. Anything that worries you at all about it or you feel comfortable with the answers? No, I feel comfortable with that. Okay. I'm comfortable with, um, I'm comfortable that they've met this, uh, this, uh, this item this, for the special exception because of the fact that the previous uh, company that was there, the uh, AAA running with its fleet vehicles, made its garage, um, uh, obviously more harmful fluids to the environment. and. Uh, I feel like the, um, the, the uh, methods of mitigation that they're proposing um, would certainly be a lot better than having the uh, previous um, company there. And somebody? Now, have you focused on any, I, I don't know if there's been any tests or anything, on the existing system, I, what did you call it, that's being used? Sister. Have you done any tests or found out from the previous occupants, like if that's got a useful life or if it's... By, from my understanding from Mr. Jetty is that it, it does have a useful life, um, that the frequency of um, removals or pumping will have to be monitored and figured out with our use compared to theirs. 
and we also have a scheduled building inspection. Um, we were going to pay for a building inspection on Tuesday of next week so we can have more information about every part of the building by then. Part of our plan is to purchase the building after five years. Um, part of their plan is to sell the building after five years, so our intent is to do this and purchase the facility as well. So now, is that a piece of leased equipment or is that part of the building? Part of the building. You might be able to get a service contract or something like that going on whatever they recommend would be the monthly basis, the semi-annual basis where it's just they're all gone through. Yes, sir. It's probably one of three things, the same things that we have at <coughs> town, those round cement containers where the drains come in that go, because that goes right into the ocean. It doesn't go through a, our sanitary system. It could be a vortex system, which is nothing more than a giant ring that goes around, which does, it separates the wastes and the waters. And the third version that I know of is sort of like a brittle water filter, which kind of allows the water to drain through slowly. I happen to have all three on my property, so I tend to know that. Uh, and, <laughs> and they do work, uh, I guess. Well, my major concern was just when the previous tenants were probably using it a little bit more and masking it out sometimes if they were doing cleaning of it actually doesn't the vehicles move. and things. It's more like a septic tank. It doesn't do anything. Right, but I'm just, I'm, I'm just saying the type of yep. things that were being run through there are going to be much different. So I just want to make sure it's got a useful life left and they're not walking into something that could be failing on them fairly soon. And you are having a building inspection, which is good. Okay. Now that, uh, sorry. Uh, I'm comfortable. I'm assuming, Mr. Longstaff, is that what Mr. Progress talks about? It falls under your jurisdiction where the, they seem like they've done a job and contacted the sanitary district and does the, the, the code office actually look at that? Um, we wouldn't specifically look at that unless unless it was part of construction that they were installing. If it's already in the building, place, nice. it would... It would just be part of the the, the real property that's there. Okay. Um, I I would know very little about the system they're talking about. I don't know. I've never seen it. I know nothing about it. Um, I expect that it's as I say, it's either a sand filter type system <coughs> in, the, in the removal of the contaminants. The the medium is also removed, yeah. or it's a filtration system where the the product passes through a medium and then that's removed. I'm not sure which that is. Those are the two types of systems I'm familiar with. I know I have no knowledge of what's in that building. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Like no. All right. A couple of things on this. This is an important one because this ties to a lot of the questions that the planning board asked us to address. So let's start off with. Uh, I want to break it into pieces. Uh, unsafe, um, unsanitary, unhelpful conditions by reason of sewage disposal. I consider this unit that we're talking about the sewage disposal. I personally don't have a problem with it. It wouldn't be allowed uh, in town if it didn't work. Those units are upwards of 100 grand. They they're very expensive. They're very high tech. And um, if it was being used for a facility that had oils, uh, it could even be a grease pit, which would even be better. So it's probably one of those types. I personally don't have a concern based on the fact we haven't had any problems. Uh, does any board member have a problem with that, disagree with it, question that? I'm all right with that. Okay. The next the second part of that question involved emissions to air or water. Um, I don't see any emissions to air or water that wouldn't be any different than anything else. Again, I think that ties to the system that they're using on the water side. And when the like feces that you're picking up. You've said you've got like a triple type of procedure where it gets bagged, then rebagged, then goes into the dumpster? Yes, sir. And as far as the traffic is concerned, I do not believe it will have an impact on the traffic and I do not recommend that there's an impact fee. Um, the boards have an opinion on that? I agree with that. I, I think it's I think it's the way they run their business, I think it's gonna be spread out and very little impact. It's tough, tough to say with that intersection because at certain times of the day it's pretty busy, like three to five-ish. It can get pretty busy down there. I, I don't know. I don't know if it will or not. Either of you have comments on that? I kind of think that they should be using the Mussy Road entrance a little bit more. 
Which entrance were you planning on using? At this Pleasure. point, it's the uh, main road side, sir. The main road side. The problem being is I think you're going to have some problems with people <coughs> if they're coming this way as opposed to people that are coming up the road from Scarborough Downs area. They're going to be able to turn in pretty easily. Yeah. So you're going to have All both All along there, there's really not a lot of turnoff. So um, if I might address like. that for a moment. Um, again, we're open to a lot of different options. Some things that I had thought about, um, our current facility is pretty hidden. People that live in South Portland have no idea that that section of town even exists until they see our business card and has our map on the back. Um, <laughs> we would be happy to do something like that as well. As uh, Part of what we're doing is pretty instructive to our new clients, um, how we're going to be handling our daycare. Um, we're going to have to educate them on a bunch of different items. Um, so how they enter and exit is not a big problem for me to continue to do. I have thoughts of, you know, if you come in from either Mussey or Scarborough downside of Payne <coughs> Road, you can make that right-hand turn onto Payne easier and come right in, and perhaps we would be forcing people to make right turns out of Payne Road as well, and then they can loop back around if they want to. Are, are your clients coming from mostly, are you looking to be mostly Scarborough clients or South Portland clients coming over as well? You know, we're hopeful that um, some people will follow us and, you know, um, but the we're other definitely not going to be there. I'm That's sorry? No, the other location is going away, sir. Um, we're hoping that um, we'll, we'll maintain the kind of customers that I would like to have, people that will drive past three other daycares to come to us because they believe that we're the best at what we do um, versus um, geographic ones. But well, anybody with sweets. <laughs> <laughs> um, the goal is to increase our presence in Scarborough. I think it's a good suggestion to have them come down Muzzy if they're coming from South Portland. Otherwise, they're coming through all those lights. I, I, it's coming from that facility every day. I drive right by this building twice a day. I know exactly what you're talking about. That left on, excuse me, that left on the Payne Road. Um, and there's really no other way that you would go from that side the majority of our clientele is on that and is not northern South Portland, northern. Nearest the highway, it's more muddy roadside. And yeah, so it might be good to have yeah. I mean, people are pretty creative, I think. They'll figure out whatever way they can get in the easiest. So it, I think it'll take care of itself just by by normal traffic flow. It doesn't take long for somebody to figure well, out. Well, just as long as they provide both parking. entrances. Yeah. yeah. Now, I, I'm assuming that the normal drop-off is about two or three minutes. Typically, yes, sir. So the car is not going to be there very long? No. Okay. I think so it would impact it more on the, on the pain road side. Okay. It's already been put down there that you can't get anything done. So uh, coming back to the question of, uh, I, I think we've all addressed the, the, the general's question, but I think we're coming back to the question of whether or not there should be an impact fee regarding that. Because uh, we've all kind of talked about A being okay. So the question then becomes impact fee, just to answer the question from the planning board. I personally, again, I think the car count is is not going to be that much. If I I don't, the building is there already. It's been there. It's already been assessed a fee. Uh, this isn't a change in use. This is not expanding the footprint. We're not doing anything. It's got X number of parking spots already. I just don't believe there should be a, another fee uh, added to it, but um, at the at the, the will of the board on that question. I agree with you. I don't. Th I can't see anything in here that would uh, lead me to believe that there should be an impact fee. In fact, if if anything, this is it's going to be less traffic than there was before. Um, I, I agree. I don't think we're going to be solving the traffic issues of Payne Road and Muzzy Road. I think it's a whole separate discussion for another board at some point to determine how to mitigate the traffic in general on there. And because this is a smaller operation than the previous uh, uh, than the previous business that was there, I don't think it's going to impact it in a negative way. People will figure out how to get in. Mr. Longstaff, do you have any idea what they were getting at with that and sending that down to us? To I think part of what they're <coughs> part of what they're getting at is that um, actually contrary to what Chairman Maroon said, the existing use probably did not never assessed any impact fees because be they were already there. Um, 
when there is a change in, of use or a change of occupancy, and um, and the, you know obviously the this, this is a, a sideways change. That's why it's a miscellaneous appeal. There is an opportunity if that new use would generate more traffic than the old use. There is an opportunity to collect some impact fees. It may be hundreds of dollars. It may be thousands of dollars. It all depends on the traffic engineering report study that's done as a part of that that analysis. Without knowing, without having the analysis done, you have no idea, quite frankly, what the impact is. Yeah. So I'm, I'm a little surprised to hear anyone say, we don't think it's going to be any impact because you don't know. There may be no impact, but nobody knows until that analysis is done and the analysis has not been done. Does the, does the analysis even get done? It, I think it, it only gets things. done if you recommend that it be done. And I guess my argument is I can't imagine enough of an impact. That impact fee test is going to cost two thousand dollars. No. What does it cost these days? You don't know that. I, I did one. <laughs> I did one a no, few I, years ago. I do know it. <laughs> no, I that that won't it won't be that much money. But it's up to you guys to decide whether or not you feel there's an impact. I'm just trying to explain. That's why that was raised. There's an opportunity to have that analysis done to determine if there's any impact, and then you know for sure, and the, the fee is based on the car counts that come out of that, that impact. There's some kind of a formula which I know nothing about. I, can give you I believe the other reason that it was brought up is because at the time we didn't have that 2010 study, so we weren't able to do a comparison of how many cars in relation to our business. And so they were asking those questions, which is why we provided that information for this meeting to give more mm -hmm. information on that. To me, it's odd. didn't have the AAA information at that time either. Right. So, you know, to me, it's odd that it's even here as a question because it's typically done by the planning board. But I can tell you, seriously, I did one. It's expensive. And I don't see enough of a reason to do that. That's just my opinion. Uh, again, more than willing to hear other arguments. But it'll delay them a couple of months, and then go back to the planning board because we don't have the authority to put fee on. And I don't see a reason, and maybe that's wrong. It, it wasn't down. my impression that it was a couple of months, uh, it, but it depends. Again, I use you apparently don't know more about it than I do, so I'll I pay for it. <laughs> it's funny when you pay for it what you remember. Um, so it's just to me, it's a sort. I honestly don't think it's needed because it's just a lot of work. Well, my point of view on it is that we have an opportunity to help or find some information out about what could be done differently down there. It is kind of a cluster at times down there, and I think that may be where they're coming from, is to try to figure out the, the traffic that was there. Every time I drove by, I never saw a vehicle drive out of there. This is going to be more of a service industry. This was more where AAA kind of kept their trucks and they would occasionally go out, and you weren't sending like two or three or five out at a time. You may be sending one out at a time, from what I saw from my previous experiences driving by. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't no, know. I don't know. But I, I just think it's an opportunity to try to help that traffic pattern down there, which at times can be pretty significant. You can sit on Muzzy Road for upwards of 10 minutes trying to get out on Payne Road, and that's right about where they're, where they're going to be, and you're going to be adding more traffic to that. Okay. I, um, did you have just from my conversations with Mr. Jetty today um, about uh, the, the 30 vehicles um, and the, the three shifts, so they would go out at 7 o'clock in the morning, they'd come back at one point to change drivers, they go back out again, they come back in, change drivers, they go back out and come back in. So I believe that um, there's more traffic going in there. By, by that count and, and adding the employees, that are coming and going, uh, you have approximately 250 visits to that facility last month per day. So the question on the table, I guess, on this specific item is, do we want, the only way we're going to know whether or not there needs to be an impact fee is by a, a traffic study. And I think the question is, do we want to have them do a traffic study, or do we not? Or do we want to assess a fee that's arbitrary, or do we not? And I'm um, open to whatever, if there's a third option, I'll for that. You can't assess a fee. You don't have, you, you can't do that. That's, that's good. <laughs> your first, the first part of your statement was correct. That's, that's, that's the all the decision. Do we want to have a, 
personally, I don't. I, I, I realize there's a problem down there. I use that muzzy road all the time, and I just don't think this business is the one to pinpoint and, and put that on. I just don't see the, I just don't see a huge change in what they do spread out over a 7 to 10 window of X amount of dogs. They stay 25% of boarding dogs, so those aren't going to be day in and day out. Those are people going on vacation, leaving for a week, most likely coming back on a Saturday or Sunday, picking their dog up when they return from their vacation. I just don't think this is... Now, if somebody says it's going to be, you know, Palace Playland, Jokers, you know, we're just going to have hundreds of kids running around in there, I'd say, yes, this is a perfect example to do a traffic study and maybe impose some sort of impact fee, but I just don't think this is the business for it. But my, my opinion is no. I agree with Mr. Richard on this one. Uh, I don't think this is the, um, the time to have the study at this point with this particular case. I agree. I mean, with the, with the numbers that were thrown out earlier of what, 1,200, 1,100, 1,200 pages <coughs> per hour, and I mean, even if everybody came in, dropped their, their dogs off at the same time and picked them up at the same time, it still wouldn't have any impact based upon those numbers. So, I think so you've dealt with the traffic generation. If you want to move to the lighting, signage, and landscaping, you can get so that's the next piece is the lighting sign. Um, did you have a chance while you were doing well, while you were doing anything else? <laughs> look at the standards for signage. I don't know if that's standard or not. Uh, again, I, my suggestion is we deal with non-conforming signs, existing non-conforming signs, all the time. We'll work with them on that. I don't know that that ne necessarily needs to be an issue that the zoning board has to concern itself Perfect. with. The board comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. So based on the fact that the uh, and they'd like to use the existing signs. So. Yeah. There are provisions there. That, that may allow that in the sign. In, in the, it depends on what they want to do with that existing sign. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll deal with that as the standards of the ordinance and dictate. The ordinance and, spells it out. Yeah. and I'm sure they don't have any objection. Yeah. No, sir. Mm -hmm. and, and the option would be, if you do, to come back to the board on that specific issue. So you, you don't like the answer. So there are options. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but it's pretty hard to deal with because we don't have a, you know, we don't have a signage proposal at this time. You're still working out the details of the. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? I said it will be prettier than it, it is now. No, no <laughs> doubt. <laughs> I, I, I don't doubt that. So, I, I, I mean, really, it's a moot point at this point because we don't know what they don't know what they want other than to use the existing sign, and we'll just deal with that according to the ordinance. Okay. So as far as the findings, facts, we'll come through that. Just the the, uh, the conclusions of law in A. Take a, a, mo a motion to approve that, that they've met these requirements. Do so I have a second on that? Yeah, second. All in favor? Four opposed? Okay. One opposed. So it's four to one. That, mo that section A carries, and then we'll come to section B. Opposed use of arcade and say vehicular concrete. <laughs> uh, pedestrian traffic conditions when added to the uh, the existing and foreseeable traffic in the vicinity. I feel that we've probably already answered that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll make a motion to approve B. Second. Any discussion on that? And a motion? Uh, so, um, vote. All favor? That's five. Discussion. Okay, the next one C. The proposed use will not create public safety problems, which would be substantially different from those created by existing uses in the neighborhood, requires some substantially greater degree of municipal fire. Police protection and existing uses in the neighborhood. Anybody, why don't we start down again with you, Mr. Blaze, if you want to discuss that? I, I have no problem with that at all. That's, I, I don't see any problem there. No comment. Mm -hmm. Oh, you got to verbalize a little bit yeah. of a finding and a conclusion. Yeah, what's important about that is to get, just get on record about that you don't see this as an issue. It helps. The reason why that's important is because, again, the, the record needs to have, if we are ever challenged, say, for instance, we prove we declined this, they could go to the Superior Court. The Superior Court would be remitted back to us to clarify. So the goal is to not have that happen. Not that we're looking to decline it. <laughs> but the point, and that's why we, we try to verbalize it. So uh, if we could. Yeah, then I would say that um, 
that will not create any sort of public safety problems or anything of this nature because uh, they already are indicating that they're going to have uh, fenced in areas to um, keep the dogs from running out in the public or running into the street or potentially running over to a neighbor's property that they'll be under control and inside of the facility. Right down. Yeah, they're, just, they're going to have the barrier up there, so I mean, I don't foresee police or fire having to go in there and deal with anything for dog bites or anything like that. So. And I agree. They um, they seem like they've done a good job of covering all their all the bases for keeping the dogs contained. That would be the the number one concern of mine. So they've addressed that. Just because it happened recently. Uh, I'll ask the question just to get on the table, but it's more because you, you're aware that probably recently there was a dog that was killed by another dog in a daycare facility. How, if you don't want to, um, how do you manage, how do you manage 12 dogs in one person? Uh, 12 dogs is actually a really great number, <laughs> um, comparatively speaking. Um, you're paired up so dogs can play appropriately together. Uh, I think you have to um, evaluate the dogs individually before they come in and are socialized. Uh, we have uh, serious substantial expertise in reading dogs' body language, behavior, acclimating them to our facility, making them feel safe and comfortable. Um, and if they don't, then they're not allowed to stay. Um, and primarily dog altercations um, Primarily, dog altercations can come from a number of different reasons, but mostly it's from uh, dogs not reading each other's language properly. Our staff is being trained every day on how to read that language. I kind of call it a um, canine meteorologist. So you're in that group and you're watching what's going on between these dogs and you see this dog stiff it up a little bit, you just walk over and say, hey buddy, come over here. And that'll distract the dog enough to lose focus from being concerned. It's a, it's a science. This is like a council meeting, Mr. Boyd. <laughs> uh, so I so I would say it's the same. That's fine. I'd, I'd just ask one question, just to get to the fire protection piece. Have you ever had a dog spontaneously combust <laughs> under your care? <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> All right. Suppose you not the sedimentation erosion. I have an adverse effect on water supplies. Um, I suppose we'll start again down with you. Um, I think they they pretty much addressed this. Uh, as far as I think outdoors, they're going to have a, a, a grass, an artificial grass, uh, and underneath a, uh, some sort of a, a device to to capture uh, sediment and, and waste. Um, it, it looks good to me. I don't. I don't think that there's any uh, effect on any water supplies. Um, they have indicated the uh, the method that they're going to be using to remove physical waste and properly dispose of it without having it harm the surrounding environment, um, which is uh, which makes me comfortable. As well as the existing cistern in place that they indicated will be inspected with their um, uh, or looked at with their building inspection to just sort of. Uh, um, evaluate uh, its functionality, its life, and uh, knowing that that's there and that they're going to take care of it will uh, also make you comfortable. Yeah, I would say it's a stern, just that being in place, knowing that it's running, getting your inspection done, giving you the useful life, and having a proper maintenance plan in place to make sure it's functioning properly and everything. I don't foresee anything. I echo all of that, and I think the weekly pickups perfect in the way that the procedure about going about picking it up and double bagging it and putting it into a dumpster, all good. The greater problem is going to be having other people use it when they're not around, to be candid. Yeah. They're locks for them. <laughs> From my experience, that's, that's yeah. my bigger problem. Um, We've had people dump like TVs and stuff just on our front door, but not really in the dumpster. <laughs> they don't bother me. So I, I, I don't see that as mattresses. Those use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to physical size, visual impact, intensity of use, proximity to vote. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't vote. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'll move that that uh, D is approved. Second. Discussion and motion. 
Mr. Chair, just thank you. Mr. Chair, just before we go any further, you had me down for, because you had sat in, I didn't realize what you were doing, you had me down for no one A, but I did not oh, is that agree with A. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry you didn't make that change. Thank you for correcting me. Uh, the proposed use will uh, be compatible with existing use of the neighborhood with respect to physical size, visual impact, intensity of use, proximity to other structures, and density of development. Uh, I mean, the building is there. <laughs> uh, you, t you take a look at the overhead uh, picture of the neighborhood, all the buildings are about the same. Uh, and if anything, I, I think there's going to be less of an impact than other types of businesses that would be there. I agree. It's a commercial. It's an existing commercial building already, an existing um, surrounded by existing commercial buildings. Uh, there is. I don't believe there's going to be any um, negative or adverse effects to the um, to the surrounding area. At least what I've been reading and been hearing this evening. Okay. No, the, the size and structure of the building pretty much fits in with all the other buildings that are along that strip and. Even going up Payne Road, it's all pretty much within what this building is doing. I agree. I actually think with that, I think it's actually going to improve the area. It's going to give it a kind of a residential feel to it with the fences and the closed in dog areas. I think it looks nice. Tied, tied to that, Ms. Longstaff has asked a great question, and this is probably the appropriate time to address it. And that would be we were coming back to the question of landscaping, which are earlier Mr. Crockett asked about. Uh, so we want to take that off the table. It's in section is the fourth paragraph and the fifth paragraph uh, of the planning board comments. Uh, I do not have, other than what we've got, a layout of landscaping, which is a challenge. Uh, do you? Uh, I'm going to look for advice from you, sir. I think you can turn to their response on that issue in which they, they describe their vision for landscaping. They don't get into detail there, but um, I think that, I, I guess that the line of questioning would be, what did you have in mind to add to the landscaping? Obviously, AAA wasn't, wasn't too concerned with landscaping. They were, you know, more mechanically oriented. So have you thought about, you know, taking a view and what you might do with that besides the fence, the, the, the nice looking fence that you proposed to put up? And Certainly. Um, we would like to have a very inviting business. Um, as you can see along the front, the ditch line hasn't been groomed or maintained whatsoever, so we would like to get in there and make sure that's all um, grassed and we intend to hire a company to help grow some nice green grass. If you think of dogs at play, you think of green grass, it's, it's part of our feel with our indoor turf, so um, maintaining the lawn area is going to be an important part to us. In addition, uh, you can't, you're not really able to see it in that picture, but they're along the left side of the building. Um, you can see some tanks out back. I would like to put some, some bushes or shrubbery in along that side of the building, just again to uh, give it a more homey feel and less industrial. Um, the muzzy side, as uh, the picture had showed before with the, um, the fencing, that we're looking into, which is the brick fencing. Um, I would envision some type of shrubbery in front of that or around that, not to hide the fence entirely, just to ac accent it, uh, as well as just flowers and just general maintenance, raking and, and just taking care of the property. So we don't have any large um, uh, plan at this point. It's just general maintenance and upkeep and beautifying the property. So, Steph, are you comfortable with managing that? Um, without direct direction from either the planning board or the zoning board? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I get the sense, and I wasn't at the meeting, and, and certainly the Klinguses would know better than I do, would, or as Karen would. Uh, I think that they were just concerned that the site wouldn't be improved in any way, and, and I think the Klinguses have responded to that with, with some ideas of their vision for what the site could look like, and I think that that would be... Um, you, you know, where this is not going to go for a site plan review, nobody's going to really be looking at this. So I think that they have the freedom to do some, some things they want to do. I don't know that we necessarily need to get involved beyond determining that they have a vision for some landscaping and that I'm sure as the proceeds will warrant, they, they will do those types of, of things too. In other words, it won't get any worse. <laughs> It's pretty, it's pretty <laughs> bare bones out there right now. So 
it's a blank canvas. Um, so I, in grass tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I, I think I I mean we can certainly I can do whatever the board asks me to do, but I don't I don't know how much involvement. I don't like big government, and I don't know how much involvement <laughs> we should actually have in in you know dictating their vision for some of the, those landscape improvements that they've just described. I, I think if you look, if you go down Route 1 here and take a left out of the facility and just go down just by Romeo's and right around the area, I think you'll see what the planning board is kind of looking for with some of those businesses down there. And it, it seems to be pretty in line with what you're saying. It's just some shrubbery, some invitingness, some plants, some greenery, some mulch, yep. so that it looks like it's a... Karen, you okay to walk them through the, the design standards? We'll deal with that. So, does anybody have any problems with this? Okay, so you've got perfect opportunities. Go right down that road. You can see what they're looking sure. for. Okay, so do that. we need to take a vote on E. That's actually a good suggestion. We do have the design standards, and I don't know if, if you folks have seen those, but that's that's also a good guide for sure. any improvements. So E, uh, move that we approve section E based on the conversations, and that uh, the whole Karen speak with fire. Um, <laughs> Second. <laughs> All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, we're coming. It's not in the flood. It's not an shoreland zone, so that comes off the table. Uh, G is just a statement of fact, and that has been met. H, the applicant has a technical financial ability. It seems like they do, and they've signed a contract and agreement. So, top of that, and then uh, I, close use will be compatible uh, with existing uses in any way with respect to generation of noise and hours of operation. We've discussed that in numerous points with the planning board. Uh, so when I go right down that again and again, the displays you start on that one. Um, they've defined their uh, hours of operation from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m., which is pretty much compatible with other businesses in that area, I would assume. And, uh, and again, the the low. Uh, amount of traffic in and out of the facility uh, shouldn't uh, provide any impact to the neighborhood whatsoever. Okay. Additionally, um, they've indicated that they're working uh, with uh, an acoustical mitigation company to sort of put up uh, soundproofing inside and outside of the building. They've indicated that they want to build as high walls as they can for their indoor-outdoor area, just sort of keep <coughs> everything contained. Um, I, be I believe that they are uh, doing what they can to mitigate uh, uh, any sort of um, sound. Yeah, I think you folks have a good plan set up for that with the wall and going as high as you can. Uh, I would suggest just basically going over and seeing your neighbors right next door to you on this side next Captain to the school, Jordan. because I think you've got a couple offices in there that do massage and meditation and things like that, just to let them know of the things that you're doing okay. that prevents the noise and things. I know there's a lot of professionals in that building. You know, I, think they, I think they've got a good plan in place for all those things that he's in keeping, so I'm fine. I agree. I think that it um, meets that requirement. And I think we've talked quite a bit about it, so I'll move the I as proof uh, as presented. I'd like to ask one question. The wall that you're proposing to put up, is that really a brick wall? Uh, you know, again, we're open for, for options at this point. Um, I definitely would like it to have the look, um, that kind of look. But, Mr. Longstaff, could you bring up the uh, front? picture of the Payne Road picture? Sure. I got a little bit of a hang up with a solid wall like that because if you make it relatively high in the summertime it's going to be like an oven inside that. Understood. Um, it, we're, we're looking to have height for a couple of reasons. One, we want to have height so you don't have to right. you know, jumping. Um, but the, the brick part of it is just from a, uh, the, you actually can't even see it, but the bottom three or four feet of the building on the brick thing. Um, so I was trying to go along with the same type of look and feel. Um, there are fence products that have um, the brick face to it. There are actually acoustic block products that have the brick face to it. Um, so 
There's a lot of different options available to us. We are actually working with um, an architect who specializes in animal care facilities. Um, so I, I plan on using his expertise in a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. You folks have, I don't think we have actually mentioned it. You folks have ample parking down there? For, absolutely. It's more than we have at our South Portland location. Because I see a lot of people parking on the lawn. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Jetty said that they were maxed out in that facility, that they just didn't have any room to breathe at all. They were parking cars wherever they could fit them. 35 cars were never going to have 35 people in there at once. Here we got 20 spaces. We got more in the row. Okay. And uh, tied to lighting, are you planning on doing anything different with lighting or using the fan that's already there? Have you thought about that? I think certainly we're going to enhance any lighting that's already there um, uh, to, uh, it's important uh, both in the morning, in the winter, in the evening, and uh, to be able to see the dogs and to, to s discern between them. Um, there, there's pretty significant outdoor um, light security lighting, but we would likely um, increase that a bit. What I'd suggest, uh, you might be the same thing I am, go ahead. Uh, yeah, no, I was just going to suggest that, again, the design standards for cutoff lighting, we we try to keep dark sky if we can, and so down lighting is really oh, yeah. important, and putting light on, on the subject rather than out into space. Uh, so those kinds of things. I think it also keeps the neighbors happier that they don't have that light pollution coming into their sure. facilities. So we can certainly work with you in, on that. Um, just I think it's important just to know what your thoughts are on that um, in case there's any specialized lighting that, you know, is going to be like Stalag 13. We've got a runner. <laughs> <one place. laughs> well, in South Portland, we have a, uh, a pole that houses our lighting for both outside yards and cameras, so we would probably do something similar to that. We could do it off the building if that's more feasible. But again, it is all higher down. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't want to interfere with the cameras. We definitely want to look at I, that. I think if you work with SEDCO and uh, everybody's comfortable here, SEDCO and uh, zone uh, for, uh, the code enforcement officer, I have thought about purview. We just deal with that. Is everybody comfortable with so, it? So I think, I think with that, you've hit all of the points that the planning board was curious about. I don't know how Thank much discussion think. actually happened at the board, but. Um, I certainly hit him. Yeah, they did. Uh, thank you. And so uh, we have a motion and a second on that item. Do I have a, a all in favor? And that's unanimous. Okay. So we come back to the question and the approval of initial appeal. And I will just say, while Mr. Chair is looking for that, you folks are definitely doing a great service to yourself by working with SEDCO. We encourage more businesses that come to town to work with SEDCO because they can help you out with idiosyncrasies that you don't have to be dealing with once you're trying to move into the business and get everything up and running and started. So it's good that you started out there. It's definitely beneficial for you folks and any other business that's coming into town. Thank you. Karen's been great and very helpful, so thanks to her as well. And so we come back to uh, appeal number 2569. Any other comments, questions, or a motion on the entire package? I would move just approval. Move approval. Yeah, move approval. A second. A second. And then did you do a question? So it's, I guess so. It, it's, it's moved and seconded, and now we get, that's okay. Motion. Uh, uh, um, to continue to carry on the conversation. Right. I move and second. That's okay. It's uh, just because I. As, as an engineer, I can't, I can't not say it, but it's a full cutoff fixture is what you're going to want to look for for lighting. That's the term you're going to look for. Thank you. That's it. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I can let that go. I said <laughs> cutoff. Do I have to say everything? That's why we brought it before. <laughs> it, has to be, it has to be full cutoff. You can say partial full cutoff. Cut that full cutoff. Don't meet the 90 degree cutoff. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for correcting me. <laughs> Sorry. Anybody have this in? Nothing. God, it's just like being home. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have a, a motion and a second on the table. Uh, the only bummer for me is that I won't be able to bring my dog there because uh, she doesn't meet the minimum standards. 
But, uh, <laughs> is it the dog or the owner? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, all in favor? That's not. That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome to Scott, bro. Thank you, everybody. Thank Good you very much. Thank you. And you did it by the book. You did a great job. So, uh, Fine. Thank you. You're both. Yay. Or nay. Yay. And the final appeal for tonight is appeal number 2570. Uh, it's a limited reduction of yard size request by Cheryl Sano, 13 Hudson Landing Road. This is map U32, parcel 29. Do you have representatives? That would be great. Can you take the microphone to state your name and address, and we'll go from there. Cheryl Sarno, 13 Dunstan Landing Road in Scarborough. Okay. Just give us a second to get organized here. Okay. Okay. trying to accomplish and we'll go from there. Well, uh, we actually was here about 13 years ago applying for a reduction in yard. Uh, at that time we were going to put an addition onto the house and that would entail us moving the bulkhead from the side of the house to the back of the house. Uh, since then... <laughs> Good night. <laughs> Good to see you again. Thank you so much for coming in. A true gentleman. Great, great history of Scarborough. The final family. Okay, I'm sorry. That's quite all right. Uh, since then, uh, I have since divorced from my ex-husband, and so I had put my house up for sale recently, and, and so when I discovered that there were several errors in doing moving part of the bulkhead on the house. And so I'm here to reapply for what was granted 13 years ago. Okay, so this, this is an appeal we talked about last meeting. Mm -hmm. And uh, we didn't talk about this appeal. We talked about this scenario. This scenario. Thank you very much. We talked about. Be the very concept. clear about that. We talked about the concept. The concept of this this concept, and it's actually different than what <coughs> we talked about. Actually, no, it's exactly the thing? same. But you don't listen to me. My wife is nice. So <coughs> anyway, uh, we'll come back to this. Uh, the issue is that this was done but not recorded at the registry, correct? Right. So my ex-husband had come down to get a building permit. He was granted a building permit and he came home with the permit and said you were all set and ready to go. I have subsequently found out that the town uh, was not aware they had issued a building permit nor did they have it logged, nor did my ex-husband take care of it with the registry. It leaves me in a quandary. So technically, we're looking at an after the fact, but I'm not so sure we are. And that's kind of, I think we've got to decide as a board how we attack this because um, it's very clear about the after the fact on the reduction yard size. And, and I, I have one opinion from the, the, the generalized conversation of last month, but reading um, the comments from the code enforcement officer. I feel a little bit different about it as, as I read it and as I as I've thought about it over the month. Um, so I want to open up to the board for just a dialogue for a second. Mm -hmm. If we look at the uh, limited reduction of yard size, uh, 1991, it was done, uh, existed before 91. Request a reduction is reasonably necessary due to the physical features, the impact and effects, the applicant has not commenced. So here's what number five is what gets us. The applicant has not commenced construction of the environment, expansion, building or structure for which the limited reduction in yard size is requested so that the board is not considering an after the fact application. Now, in my opinion, that's the key word. I'm gonna use, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use uh, 
What's my favorite judge's name? Just tell me. What was that? No, the uh, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> I'll leave him. Um, but anyway, I I want to. I think we should be taking this word literally and the statement literally, uh, and I think it takes some pressure off from the answer, because really we have two choices. One is to approve it. The other is to decline it, where it will then go back to the town, where the town will either require uh, a fine or a fee, or a, make it be removed. It'll be the town's call on that. I don't see any malicious intent here. It's obvious an error, but that doesn't justify it's just overriding the rule. So again, listen to number five and, and see if you buy my argument. The applicant has not commenced construction of the enlargement, expansion, building, or structure for which the limited reduction in yard size is requested, Calm. so that the Board of Appeals is not considering an after-the-fact application. The application was submitted and approved. The completion of the sign-off and the re recording it was not, but the issue of the application was not. Nothing had happened prior to the application. So in my opinion, we can sincerely justify number five, and one, two, three, and four are pretty straightforward. So if the board buys that argument, I think we can move this fairly quickly. If you disagree, please share that, and we'll take on uh, a disagreement on that, and I'd love your view on that too, Mr. No, I, yeah, I agree with that too. The wording is is where it, it sh the application has been made, so it is not an after the fact. Construction has commenced after the fact. It's 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 application is made, so I think it's 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 okay. I think that's okay that we approve that and that meets criteria of that. The problem we get to is the applicant does have a burden after that to make sure it's recorded. That's correct. That's the burden that we have on and it. That's what drives us back. That's what forced it to come back here. Um, but nothing is going to happen other than a recording. Because the, the application has been done. The work has been done. So I'm arguing a, a legal style that that word means exactly what it means. And after the fact application. They applied. They had not previously done the work. They missed a step, and this is a correction of a miss, as opposed to any reason that, and again, I go back up to you, and I spent a lot of time trying to, to, to rationalize this, because to be candid with you, I did not want this to come, this concept to come before. I didn't know what it was going to be, mm -hmm. but we talked about it, and you said, what did you guys think about this, and I was dead against it. So, uh, because I honestly felt there was no out for us, so just so you knew where I stood on it. I tried to take some time on this and and get my arms around it. And if you look at uh, the other comment, there's another piece in here that I think allows us uh, the the issue. Uh, and it's the uh, has not commenced construction of the enlargement or expansion building structure, for which the limited reduction yard size is requested. So they're coming here, not requesting anything be done. They're only clarifying an error that was made, a paper error that was made, at, and it's not after the fact. It's not, the question would be, did they get caught doing something? The, the reason, in my understanding of, the, of number five, is they got caught, and now they're trying to get, get a sign off. And, and that is not what happened here. And so if you think of it, as a general purpose, a general overview, that's why I didn't want it to come here, because we couldn't meet them for five. But if you take the words literally, after the fact application, the application has already been completed. All we're doing is signing off to allow them to re, just document, document the application. And I think that does allow us to do that and meet the letter of the law. But we're considering this as a new application. Well, I think that's one of the questions is we actually... Right down on the bottom, it says along with the application. 
I have included paperwork for the approved variance. It is absolutely the case, and I don't disagree with that, but again, I come back to what is it? And what is this? And this is nothing more than a correction, and we can talk about, right now we're just on a fair comment, and that's what I think we have to talk about, and then we need to make a decision to vote on it, and once we've made a vote on that, then we can continue with the next process, so we need to hear different arguments. I'd like to know why the town never picked this up. Actually, they, first of all, they issued a permit after six months, which was wrong, and they should have, they should have known that it wasn't recorded, because they're supposed to get a sheet of paper back saying it was recorded. I mean, the town is at fault as much as the applicant is at fault. I agree with you, and it wasn't as long as that piece of document. And I still get blamed for stuff that happened 15 years ago. And we dealt with this back in 2003, and we approved it and everything like that. And they left, and I don't know why they, why did you wait so long to get a building permit? My ex-husband was handling all the house projects, so I didn't follow up behind him to make sure he was doing everything properly. I think we're getting at why are we coming today? Why today? No, no, I was wondering why it was more than six months after the appeal was granted. In all fairness, it was only a few weeks, more than six months, so it was, the time frame was tight. I know that, but it was six months after they came to the board. I wish I could answer that, but like I said, my ex-husband handled that stuff. So you don't know whether, what the plans were as far as building or anything like that? I know we had a plan to do it, we just... Nobody ever... Well, the interesting thing about that, Ms. Blaze, is that at that point, what should have happened is they come back to the board for an extension, and it didn't, which I think is Ms. Pullman's best fault, too. Right. Well, I think my big thing with this is I think we're setting ourselves up with this one, hearing it, because everything was done, something slipped through the channel, and now we're coming back and we're trying to fix it. But I don't know if this should even be really before us. I don't know if this should just be a town fix with the errors that were made. I don't know. I can't. I think I tried to explain this before. Yeah, you did. There is no other... The only reason it's here is you've got two ways to go, a non-action letter or this. The town's attorney has already said those are the two options. There is no administrative fix at the town level, so I don't want to hear any more about that. But the non-action letter... The non-action letter is one of those options. That's not what I call an administrative fix. That's a non-action letter. It's not like we can just sign off on the variance and say, yeah, go take it back to the registry. It's good to go. We don't have that option. That would be great if we did, because that would be the perfect thing to do here. Why? We don't... We can't do that. Why can't it be registered now? Because the night... It has to be recorded within 90 days of the date of issue of the variance. Otherwise, the variance expires. The variance is void. So technically, the variance was void 90 days after it was approved in April or whatever it was of 2003. It was voided. If it had been recorded, we should have received that notice of recording. That would have gone in the file. And then when they came in, and by rights, they have six months to apply for their building permit. They could have come in, you know, before six months. We would have looked and seen that it was recorded. Since it wasn't, we should have looked and seen that it wasn't recorded, at which time Mr. Maroon's exactly right. We would have, today, I would have made them aware that they need to go back to the board and have a new variance issued before any construction began. That didn't happen. A permit was issued in error. They relied on that permit. They constructed part of the project. At that point, they didn't go any further, but they did the first piece, which was to move the bulkhead so that the addition could be built. The addition was never built, but the bulkhead was moved, and the variance had expired and was voided. But they didn't know that. 
we didn't catch it so they relied on a building permit which was issued in good faith and, and, and applied for in good faith yes they missed we missed it twice we didn't we missed the variance not being recorded we missed the fact that six months had gone by either one of those things could have been corrected at that point was was the bulkhead moved prior to the building permit being no 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 Okay. The bulkhead was was moved as part of the, the building permit that was applied for. Okay. I, I don't know why six months expired before they decided to go. I don't know that that's relevant okay. in this case. Okay. The relevant facts are a building permit was issued, shouldn't have been. Um, the variance was issued but not recorded, should have been. Uh, so mistakes were made. The bulk, they didn't move the bulkhead until after they received they came in the in building a, permit. To, to the best of my knowledge... To the best of my knowledge, and I wasn't there, despite what Mr. Maroon says, <laughs> it wasn't my fault, I wasn't there, but to the best of my knowledge, they applied for the building permit, and then they moved the bulkhead. So, so there was no after-the-fact issue going on. Mr. Crockett's concern is legitimate. Yes, it, it may set a precedent, but I don't look at it the same as somebody building something without a permit and then coming that's a true after the fact you did it you didn't get a permit you, you didn't even ask you built it now you're coming back because you want to sell your house and you got to correct all these issues that's where the non-action letter or a notice of violation in order for correction are the two appropriate things I would never bring that to the board that can't be heard that you cannot issue a variance for something that was never permitted in the first place we permitted this erroneously, but we permitted this. No, we didn't do it. We didn't permit it erroneously. Yeah, we did. No. Well, it passed. It passed the zoning board of appeals, right? Right. It, yeah, they they did get the variance, and they even presented the variance, right. and it still got missed. But yeah, all the steps. The only step that was missed was the recording. Otherwise, everything would have been fine. And the non-action letter prohibits the sale? No, it, it, doesn't, sale? it doesn't necessarily prohibit the sale, and Mr. Maroon has even alluded to the it fact that it. sometimes non-action letters will work, but not for every bank, not for every... F I, and I don't know what the situation is here. I don't know who you're working with, and I don't know... I emailed you, but I didn't get a response as to whether or not they would accept a non-action letter. It was not an option. It was not an option. So... Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. I'm aware of that. Um, I know you said that you've you've done several of them. That was fine. Um, we insure over it. Other companies don't. It depends. It, it depends. And, and the bottom line is that you think the right way to do it is to fix it. So I agree with the response that we need to fix it. I think my, Leroy brought, if I could just one more thing. I think Leroy brought up, a, uh, Mr. Crocker brought up a good point, and that is, are we are we reissuing an old variance? Or are we looking at a new application? And I think you you do ca you have to look at it as a new application, but you have to look at it with an eye to what was done before, and, and that was that they did come for the same exact variance. It was granted, and a step was missed. So it is a new application only because you can't the old application would would have expired as well. So it has to be a new application, but it's for the exact same thing and nothing more. And, and I think that's how you kind of have to look at it. This is just my opinion, but I, I, I understand all of that. I, I think that what we're up against is that, so this is just a clerical error that has occurred. We, sh as a board, I think should determine if it was malicious or not malicious. I think it's clearly not a malicious act on the part of the homeowner. Therefore, I think our only job should be to put it through the, through the right procedure, which is a new application, approve it based on the fact that there was nothing malicious here other than just a, a clerical error. That's all it is. It's a clerical error. I don't, I don't think we have to cloud it, confuse it, or anything. I think it's a, that's, it just boils down to it's just one step missed. His hands are tied. Mr. Longstaff cannot just... Sign him, you know, wave his magic wand, and it's all good. So we we have to then push it through. But I think that's what we should do in the future: is just push it through. The board should determine if this was done maliciously, any malintent. No, okay. Therefore, based on that, we will reissue what we can't change, which is a moved bulkhead. And I think it should be as simple as that. The only way I'd, I would challenge that, but still agree with you, is that we have to we have to meet number five. Yeah. And that my argument is exactly yours and my justification for using your argument 
is I think we meet number five because the application was done prior to the wire. And I'm considering the application the true application, not the repairing application. Okay, I, I, yep, I, so I agree. That, that's why I, I feel exactly like you do. Okay. I needed to deal with number five, and that's how I, I, I that's take, how. take it literally. So we're not looking I, at this as a new application? We're looking at this as a new application, because it is. Because it is. But we're acknowledging its realities, we're, we're acknowledging the mistakes, and we're reading number five very clearly so that we don't put ourselves in a spot in the future. Mm -hmm. The application, there is no after-the-fact work. The application is, in essence, part of two pieces. And when it's recorded, it actually becomes part of the final package of the whole thing. You've got the, you've got the three pieces. And it's recorded, you've got the, the building permit, you've got the final inspection. It completes it. And so to me, that's the, that's the, the legal way to deal with it and the ethical way to deal with it. I agree. And, and, it, and it's it's tidy, it's clean, and on she goes, and, and she has a clean bill of sale to, you know, a, a sellable item with no past clerical error, you know, errors floating out there. That's what I feel, so. My, my strong opinion on this would be we just need to be very careful how we word it if we do choose to do that because we don't want things coming back on a random basis and people trying to challenge it and say, well, you put this through. You're right. You should put mine through. I think we need to go above and beyond to make whatever verbiage we're putting in there be enough so if someone ever tried to challenge and it again. Just tie all of our conversations. I, and I, would, I would offer that the, the discussion captured in the minutes is, is what you're looking for. The, the, the decision fact. isn't going to be any different if you approve it. It's, it. It is for what it is, but it's the discussion surrounding the approval that sets the basis and, and the body of evidence that the applicant has presented. The original appeal approval, the original permit that was applied for, the application, the actual permit card that was granted, everything is there, the dates. So, I mean, the body of evidence is clear how this tracked, whereas somebody else might come for a, a similar thing and perhaps they never applied for the, the permit, you know, they never applied for a permit or they, you know, the, the facts can be completely different, so I think you have to look at the body of, of evidence in the application, in the appeal, and then your discussion surrounding why you feel the way you deal, do on those items. Is there any other type of appeal that this could be handled in, like an administrative appeal? or No, not really, because an administrative appeal would be um, the applicant coming to <coughs> To, to state that they felt I made a mistake in, in the way that I handled something or, or in, the, in a determination that I made. I made no determination on this. They, they picked it up themselves and discovered the error. So there's no administrative appeal for this. Um, that's only to appeal my decisions. Um, some towns will also appeal, use the administrative appeal to, to um, do an interpretation of some vague item in the ordinance that nobody quite understands so the code officer or nor the applicant understand what it means what the intent was so they'll bring it to the board and the board would make a determination what is that trying to say our ordinance doesn't even allow that it's it's very clear on what administrative appeals are uh, suffice to say not i don't want to belabor it this this is the only these are the only two options i've already brought it to the and town and one option is not acceptable one, op one option is acceptable to me, but it's not acceptable to the applicant because it doesn't do any anything for them. It, it in this case, they can't get financing, and the only reason they're trying to correct this is so that they can go through with this transaction legally. So, okay. wh well, well, wait a minute. What does the bank need from you people? Yeah, that's a question. Give us a name and address. on the record. I'm Jody Nutting. I'm Scarborough resident. I'm also a broker with the Real Estate Network for Cheryl. Um, so the buyers who are purchasing her property, their lender, they won't get. Um, they're not. They are. They won't be able to have a clean title, and they therefore they won't ensure. They won't be able to continue on with the purchase of the property. So they won't um, get clear or approval from the lender, the local lender that they're using to um, be able to purchase the property with this cloud on the title. This is, um, you know, the variance 
being an issue. Well, what will they accept? Oh, only a clean title. Only just being completely cleared up. They won't accept a letter of non Yeah, but how, how do they want it cleared up? They want it cleared <coughs> up that it's, there's no longer a cloud on title, that it's registered, that it's in, you know, it's, it's been registered in the, in the registry of deeds, or, uh, you know, the registry, and um, that it's no longer an issue. They, it affects the marketability long term for anybody who's purchasing the property because they, next time, if a letter of consent works for them, it may not work for the next set of buyers that may purchase their property. And so it affects the pool of buyers that they'll potentially be able to buy, that will buy for their, buy that property. So they're looking for? A clean title, no issues. A well, clean title. When? We're not involved in titles. Well, the variant, I mean, this, this issue is so certainly... So if we grant a variance yes. the same way that we granted a variance before... Exactly. Except we make some sort of a statement <coughs> about after the fact. Right, it, when it's recorded, all will happen is it'll just be recorded, and then once it's recorded, it'll be considered part of the record. As part of the record, they'll clean the title. The other option is that I know of is the only other option is if the previous owner had uh, owner's title insurance, most companies will insure over that. So they actually acknowledge that they're on the hook for it. They acknowledge that the town's not going to do anything. But, and there are some lenders that won't do that. It's just, it, it's, it's standard practice, but there are lenders that won't do it. And I don't know whether or not there was title insurance on the property. There it is. wasn't. There is title insurance. However, time's kind of a, of the essence at this point. It was always brought to our attention once the, the survey was being done for the buyer. And immediately, when Cheryl learned of this, immediately that afternoon at noon, yeah. I learned it at yeah. 11, yeah. she immediately yeah. came to town, City Hall to try to rectify and figure out what, you know, what is needed to be done. This, I believe, was probably February 26, maybe? Yes. Sometime around that, that, that date. Yes. So, um, uh, so you know, it, she, what was the word? I kind of lost, lost my train of thought. What was the question? She was doing the best she could. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. So, time is the essence. So, um, she did everything that in, she could possibly do to get it rectified. She's purchasing a home back to back on the sale of her property. So it's, this isn't it just impacting Cheryl, it's impacting the wonderful set of buyers who are hoping to purchase her home and move, who have given notice to their, land, you know, their landlord. Um, and the person that she's buying their property from, their, her, the new property from, is impacted as well by all of this. I don't know. I, I don't know what else you want to hear for an answer. I, just, I, I think that, you know, if, as you said, there was no malice. It was completely innocent. The city of, or the town of Scarborough has 50% responsibility, in my opinion, because mm -hmm. they didn't do clerically what they were supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So it would be unfortunate for poor Cheryl to be, you know, the one that loses out because it's not approved. And it wasn't just her, so. I think, Mr. Chair, I think the, the, the point earlier, and I agree with Mr. Crockett and with Mr. Richard regarding that we need to acknowledge the uniqueness of the situation and make it clear in the minutes, as we are with this discussion right now, um, that there was my interpretation that there was no uh, malicious intent with this, that indeed it was a clerical error. Um, I agree with your interpretation for this one uh, unique instance that we must acknowledge uh, for the record and uh, move forward. Any other discussion? So why don't we go through the requirements of, so we're at this point establishing that we are going to hear this as a limited reduction of yard size. Anybody disagree with that? Okay. Uh, the existing buildings or structures on the lot, <coughs> which were limited reduction of yard size, is requested to be erected prior to July 3rd, 1991, and the lot is a vacant lot non-conforming lot of record. This is a non-conforming lot of record. Uh, I don't know when it was built, but it meets the non-conforming requirements because it doesn't belong. But when, do you know when it was built? Uh, 1850, I believe. 1850, site, pretty close to 1991. So uh, I think that's pretty straightforward. The requested reduction is reasonably necessary to permit the owner or the occupant of the property to use and enjoy the property in essentially the same manner as other similar properties are utilized in this district. And Mr. Crockett, if you wouldn't mind 
I think you're probably the best to clarify. I think this is a good place to put the, the, the your logic in as part of the record, if you're comfortable with that. Uh, about you need to, this is a one time incident. If I worded it perfectly. Well, I, I think Mr. Richards actually Either way. worded it better than I did as far as the verbiage that we need to put in there for it wasn't malicious. Or we'll just take it from there. So we'll just take the, if you're comfortable, Mr. Richards, we'll just take that information from the finding the fact <coughs> that were earlier mentioned. Okay. Yeah. Everybody comfortable with that? Yeah, as long as we're <coughs> completely clear with that, so it's doesn't pop up again on us. And due to the physical features of the lot or the location of the existing structures on the lot, it would not be practical to construct a proposed expansion enlargement or new structure in conformance with the currently applicable yard size requirements. It would mean removing the bulkhead and putting it back, which seems um, what's the word to use? Practical. It just doesn't seem practical for something as minor as a mistake. Actually, I would say the town's a two-thirds responsible because they also went over the third the days. So uh, I say that goes on the record. Uh, is anybody comfortable with that? Mm -hmm. okay. The impact, the effects of the enlargement, expansion, or new building or structure on the existing uses of the neighborhood will not be substantially different from or greater than the input impacts and effects of the building or structure which conforms to the yard size requirement. And I don't see any effects whatsoever, at least in the last eight years or whatever it was done. Does anybody disagree with that? No. Okay. And the applicant has not commenced construction. And again, I'll, I'll reiterate this. The applicant has not commenced construction of the enlargement, expansion, building, or structure for which the limited reduction in yard size is requested. And my part to that is this request has nothing to do with doing anything. It's re repairing a clerical error. And so it's not, even though normally we would interpret number five as doing something, and then this would be coming back to us because somebody got caught and now has to correct their error and trying to, oops, sorry, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to say I'm sorry than it is to get the approval attitude. That's not the case here. And that, that part clears that up. And then it goes on to read so that the Board of Appeals is not considering an after the fact application. We are not this is not an application for moving a bulkhead. This is an application to repair a mistake regarding documentation of an application moving a bulkhead. Thus it meets number five uh, from a legal perspective, and sure. that, that's my position on that. Do we put anything on that based upon the prior approval? Or? And I think that's exactly correct. It's based on the prior approval. And, and again, mm -hmm. uh, just to reiterate, and, and again, it's not part of the findings of fact, and I'll, I'll tie it into the conclusions of why this is the issue. We are not considering an after-the-fact application because, in fact, an application was completed it was done, the work was then done. This reflects not the work, but rather the repair of the application. So the work had already taken place per the requirement of the initial application. This is repairing the damage done by the procedures of the uh, implementation of the application, which is different than repairing something that was done maliciously. And I need to open up the boards uh, to open, you know, open the public hearing on this before I come back to you. So I'll open the public <laughs> hearing. Anybody wish to talk on this? <laughs> I do have a uh, sure. <laughs> letter. Um, this is an uh, inquiry. Uh, hi, Brian. Upon uh, recommendation uh, in your return phone call to me, I am emailing our question to you regarding the Zoning Board of Appeals, number 2570. This is from Barbara. Barbara uh, Swartzlander, yeah. and these are the following questions that she and Sheldon Kale, uh, K uh, of 40 Orchard, Orchard Street had. Mr. Street? Chairman, yeah. just in the name of expedition, they had some questions of wondering how it concerned their lot. In the end, when I answered their questions, they were fine with it. They had no problems with it. So, so let's put that it's on not record. for or against, it's they just they're fine. Yeah. So just for the record, that, that has been dealt with through the Court Enforcement Office. So I'll 
close the public hearing. Uh, any further discussion on the motion? Uh, do I have a motion? So moved. As presented in whole. Right. And uh, do I have a second? Second. Discussion on the motion as proposed. Are we going to... Who, who's going to write that paragraph that explains all of this? Because that's... Sh <laughs> your, your decision, I think, will be fairly succinct. Again, I would point to the minutes, the discussion, as the basis for the decision. I don't think you have to write a book on the decision. No, okay. true. The minutes will back it up. True. Yeah. And but it, but it, should, it should include... It will. Errors by both parties. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it'll, it, we'll, we'll make sure the fact, and the facts are all stated in the minutes again. So it's, I think it's very clear. Okay. Uh, it's very clear how you're coming to this. Um, and, and you don't have to come to this. Certainly, if everybody was against it, it would fail. But I think that there's good um, rationale for if you, if the board so pleases, can approve this without worrying too much about setting a bad precedent because of the facts, the discussion of those facts in the minutes and the way that we'll, we'll write the, um, the decision notice. Okay. okay. So we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you. So Thank away. you very, very much. <laughs> Okay, that uh, ends uh, the agenda for tonight. Do you have anything to add tonight? Uh, oh, we have only to remind the board that next month's meeting is on a Thursday May 12th. following this, May 12th, not May 11th, which would be the normal date. We got bumps because of budget, I think budget hearing, budget okay, something. Sure. Somebody had the room. So we, we will be meeting Thursday the 12th, not... Wednesday the 11th. At this location. Right? At this location. And you want to oh, yeah. Oh, right. Okay. James is up. So, um, in my profession as an electrical engineer, I will be giving a presentation tomorrow in South Portland. Actually, Brian, do you have that piece of paper in front oh. of you that I gave you earlier? At least the location. I don't have it in front of me. So, there's been a, a, a movement by a group of municipalities for, um, I can go back, uh, by uh, sort of the town of Falmouth, Freeport, uh, Wyndham, South Portland, Biddeford, Rockland, as well as the City of Portland to make a retrofit for all of their street lighting fixtures to remove them from the lease uh, from the uh, utility CMT, have them uh, owned directly by each municipality, uh, primarily for the retrofit and change to LED source fixtures rather than the metal halide, hypersodium, sodium, orange colored, discolored fixtures we've had for the past forever years. Um, so uh, from so 2.30 pretty. to 4.30 tomorrow afternoon at the um, community center on 21 Nelson Road in South Portland, um, there's going to be an agenda and discussion um, with the Greater Portland Council of Governments to sort of discuss the, um, the nuts and bolts of how to go about this. And I'll be giving a presentation for about half an hour uh, regarding the basics of LED lighting and the things to look out for that municipalities need to be aware of when they're selecting a contractor or an ESCO or a designer. Hi, we have some LEDs in, like uh, out here now. There are LEDs in the town hall, I think. Mm -hmm. Are you saying that they can go off the grid with those? Is that, is that what they're doing? Uh, no, no. The, so the, the idea being um, uh, they will be on the grid. The, the towns will still pay for the electrical bill. Uh, currently, uh, nearly all the municipalities in the state because the light fixture, the old cobra head fixtures are on a uh, utility pole, the utility owns them, and the utility maintains them, and they charge the municipality a leasing fee every 15 years or so. Um, and they, because of uh, the newer technology, the lamp sources consume much more energy, they're a lot more expensive to maintain, uh, and the utility has been reluctant to change over to LEDs because it's, um, it's a loss of revenue for them. To be, to be succinct about it. Um, 
So with the Public Utility Commission, there has been a movement, and finally they were able to provide three options to every municipality in the state where you can either maintain the current leasing agreement where the utility owns the light fixtures on the utility poles and maintains them. A second one is the uh, municipality pays the utility for a special fixture that they want to have on the pole. So if they want an LED, they'll pay the utility for it. Or the third option uh, is the town will cut the leasing agreement with the utility and the town or municipality will have to own the cost and maintenance of installation of their own light fixture on the utility poles. Yeah, so I, I feel like this is sort of a, a growing thing that you're going to see more and more of in the years to come as the technology becomes much more cost friendly as well as energy efficient and it's a big green initiative. So tomorrow from 2.30 to 4.30 there will be a, a regional summit on street light conversion uh, co-hosted by the Town of Falmouth, Freeport, City of Portland, Town of Wyndham and the Mount Desert Sustainability Committee. Uh, from 2.30 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. at the Community Center on 21 Nelson Road in South Portland, and I will be there. That's excellent. So uh, that's all I have to say about that. That's impressive. Thank you. Any other comments? I'm not doing any. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anybody else have anything? Do you have a motion to adjourn? Yeah, motion to adjourn. Oh, yeah. No, I'm second. Okay. Oh, there. Yeah, thank you. Have a great night. <laughs>